in one of the darkest times in human history, when the voice of God was silent for 400 years. Suddenly, without notice and without provocation, redemption came to all men. And on an old rugged cross, on the stony hills of Calvary outside of the city of Jerusalem, the sins of mankind were redeemed one final time as God expresses his love for all of man when he poured his wrath on his son at a cross and it appeared that evil had won he rose and he was resurrected he lives that we may live Today we're going to address the most familiar and popular sermon ever preached. The opening words of this sermon are among the most familiar in all of Scripture, talking about the Beatitudes found in Matthew 5, 3 through 16. Beatitudes is the Latin word for the blessing of the Lord, and Christ's words are reassurance to those who take His name in a world of chaos. The Beatitudes define us define who we are as Christians, but they are not what people think they are or perceive they are. Christ never offered these words as qualifications for the kingdom of God. If you are reading what he is saying, you will find that Christ views these characteristics of those who have already found their place in the kingdom of God. The Beatitudes are not a prescription for salvation. They are a description of a saved man. Read with me, please, Matthew 5, 3 through 16. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil falsely against you for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward which is in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets which went before you. You are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewithal shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast down and trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it on a lampstand put it under a bushel, but they put it on a lampstand that it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works. Glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Father, in these defining words, Father, we pray that the blessing of God will come upon all who take these words out of a pure heart, a sincere spirit, and a commitment to love and to serve you as the body of Christ. Today, as a priest of God, may the blessing that comes from this meeting flow into every eye and every ear that hears, Father Lord God. May this ministry, which is committed to the salvation of the soul and the discipleship of the believer, Father, bless your heart with its purpose and motives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The word blessed refers to the well-being of those who because of their relationship to Christ and His Word received God's kingdom consisting of His love, His care, 
His salvation, His protection, His provision, and His daily presence in everyday living. But there are certain requirements if you want to receive the blessings of living for God's kingdom here on this earth. Each of these blessings, and even the salt reference and the light reference, indicate a transforming work of the Spirit taking place inside of each and every one that has been saved at the cross of Jesus Christ. Let me show you what I mean here. Let me extrapolate on this. Each one of these blessings is a unique characteristic of a true child of God. First of all, in Matthew 5, verse 3, the Bible says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It is vitally important that we remind ourselves that we are not spiritually self-sufficient. We need the power of the Holy Ghost in every area of our life, from His power to His life to His sustaining grace to inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible says in Psalm 34, 18, The Lord is nigh unto them that have a broken heart, and saveth such as have a contrite spirit. Psalm 51, 17, the Bible says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. In Isaiah 57, verse 15, the Bible says, For thus saith the high and the lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit and the heart of of the humble, and revive the heart of the contrite ones. In in Luke 6, verse 30, the Bible said, Blessed be the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. In this parallel passage found in Luke 6, 20, the blessing applies to the poor without qualification. Jesus lived in a time when we do today that the the wealthy believed that they had secured their place in heaven and the poor are cursed. Jesus declared that he would be the final authority on who is truly blessed. And let me share something with you for just a moment. There are a number of televangelists saying that being poor is a curse, a curse they they created themselves. Nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. Just because they have been blessed does not mean that someone who is not as rich as they are is cursed because of their lack of faith. That is ridiculous. And there are some of them that I even watch and admire when they pollute the airwaves with this nonsense. There are multitudes of millions of people that are poor and broke and destitute, which had nothing to do with anything that they personally did. The Christian faith call is to reach everybody, including the poor, the destitute, the suffering, the broken, and the beaten, and to slap a religious curse on them because they just happen that their lot in life happens to fall there is the most arrogant, pompous preaching of the gospel that I can imagine. They are poor because they are poor. They are poor because they're struggling with life. Not everybody lives in America has money and has power and has all of that that we brag about. Praise God if you do. But if you do, it is your responsibility to give to the poor what you can, to look out for those that don't have as much as you. I'm not talking about spiritual communism or socialism. It is a matter of God's heart that you consider the poor. But it's even worse when you condemn them for their lot in life when they had nothing to do with it. It saddens me. It breaks my heart, to be honest with you. And there's no greater religious arrogance that I know of than to call people who are poor or don't have anything sinners because of their lot in life. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs will be the kingdom. I guarantee you, God is going to reconcile the poor unto himself. Next, Matthew 5, verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word mourn has a three, the the word mourn in this illustration has a three-fold meaning. Number one, 
To mourn is to grieve over our own weaknesses and personal shortcomings in relation to God's holiness and the standards of His righteousness and kingdom power. In other words, none of us got saved because we were well enough or healthy enough or strong enough or wealthy enough to earn it. We are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Number two, we mourn over the things that grieve the heart of God. To have our feelings and burdens with the things that afflict the heart of God. Do you even know what afflicts the heart of God? We should mourn and have the heart of God. All men should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That God's love could be preached and proclaimed. That all might receive grace in Jesus Christ. The vernacular is not seldom seen what the heart of God is when he looks over a sin-sick world and longs for communion but can't because it's up to you to want him in your life. Number three, to mourn is to be afflicted within our spirits over the sin and the immorality and the cruelty of this world. This is a fallen world. This world fell because of man's sin and remains a fallen world because of man's sinful nature. Now I know that we live in a generation where God loves everybody and nobody does anything wrong, but the fact of the matter is all men have a sinful nature that needs to be addressed before they can have fellowship with God. And it is our responsibility to... Give that message of hope to all people in sin and change this world. The Bible says in Isaiah 61, verses 2 through 3, to comfort all that mourn and to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that we might be called the tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Notice it says the oil of joy for mourning. The anointing oil, the Christos, the anointed one, the oil of joy to comfort all that are afflicted in this world. In Ecclesiastes 7 verse 4, the Bible says, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. In 2 Corinthians chapter Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to be comforted by them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth in Christ. Matthew 5, verse 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Psalm 37, verse 11, the Bible says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Psalm 147, verse 6, the Bible says, The Lord lifts up the meek, but casts the wicked to the ground. Psalm 149, verse 4, the scripture says, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people and will beautify the meek with salvation. The meek are those who are humble and submissive before God. They find their refuge in him and commit their way entirely to the service and the grace and the love of God. They are more concerned about God's work and God's people than what might happen to them personally. The meek, rather than the aggressors, will ultimately inherit the earth. Matthew 5, verse 6, the Bible says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for this for they shall be filled. Right in the center of the Beatitudes is the singular most important verse in this sequence. The foundational requirements for all godly living All godly work and all godly personal advancement is to strive for a greater degree of righteousness in your daily living. Proverbs 10 verse 2, the Bible says, Treasures of the wicked profit nothing, but righteousness delivers the soul from death. 
Proverbs eleven eighteen. He that soweth righteousness shall also reap a reward. Proverbs 21, verse 20, the Bible says, He that followeth after righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness, and honor. Matthew 6, 33, the scripture says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. 1 Timothy 6, 11, But thou, O man of God, Flee after these things and follow after righteousness. Now he's talking about, he just finished a discernment about Christians and followers of Christ falling in love with money, the love of money. He said, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Verse 11, he says, But thou, O man, flee these things and follow after righteousness. Your reward will come from your personal righteousness. Not what you accomplish, not what you do, not what you say. Your personal commitment to the Holy Spirit and His work in you for the righteousness of Christ to be revealed in you. To hunger, or in this case, to seek our verbs, which implies being continually absorbed in a search for something or making a strenuous and diligent effort to obtain something. The spiritual conditions of all Christians throughout all of their lives consist of a constant pursuit of righteousness, which is defined by their hunger and thirst for, number one, the presence of God. And Deuteronomy 4, verse 29, the Bible says, But thou shalt seek the Lord thy God with all but if thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find, even if they find, search for him, with all of their heart and with their soul. And Jeremiah 29, verse 13, the Bible says, And when you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Number two, the word of God. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 130, The entrance of the word is a light. In Psalm 138, verse 2, the Bible says, I have magnified my word above my name. Do you understand that God, what God is saying here? His holy name is secondary to the integrity and holiness of his words he pours out to us. It's our way of finding him and knowing that it's him and not some cheap imitation formed by the devil. Number three, communion with Christ. Philippians 3 verses 8 through 10, yea doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Understand, the righteousness that we are attaining to is not our own righteousness, but it's his righteousness in us. And when we fill ourselves with him in prayer, study of the word, seeking the presence of God in worship and prayer and faith, and continually centering our souls upon the truth of God's word, then we become God's righteousness God's holiness and a light in this world through our personal devotion to him and nothing by which we did. He responds to faith. He responds to commitment. He responds to people who understand what this truly means. He can take a greater place in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit 
When you subject yourselves and surrender yourselves to the pursuit of righteousness in your life in every area of your life. That's why this is probably the most important of all of them because it's the one you can see the greatest effects of. Number four, the fellowship of the Spirit. Again, I'm talking about communion with the Holy Ghost. In John 14, verses 15 through 17, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Comforter, that He will abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees Him not, neither knows Him. But you know Him, for He lives in you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. In John 14, verses 25 through 27, the Bible says, These things have I spoken to you while yet being with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace leave I unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In John 15, verse 26, the Bible says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he will testify of me. The Holy Ghost testifies that Jesus Christ is Lord. In Psalm, John 13, verse 16, the Bible says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, he will say, he will speak, and he will show you things to come. The Christian's hunger for the things of God can be destroyed by worldly anxiety, deceitfulness of riches, desires for material things, worldly pleasures, and failures to abide in Christ. When the hunger of believers when the hunger believers for God and His righteousness is destroyed, they will begin to die spiritually, entering into something called a wilderness experience. When you have allowed the things of this world to consume you, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the Spirit of God will withdraw Himself from you while you're consumed with that and allow yourself to get in a funk that will keep you from being in the presence of God. Now I said F-U-N-K. Funk. It'll be a cloudy, miserable, lonely experience that will separate you from the love of God. For this reason, it is essential that we must always continually be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's convicting work in our lives. Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart. The pure in heart are those that have been delivered from the power of sin by the grace of God and now strive without deceit to please and glorify God and to be like Him. They seek to have the same attitude of heart that God has, a love for righteousness and a hatred for evil. Our heart, which consists of the mind, the will, and the emotions are to be in tune with the heart of God to qualify for pure in heart. Only the pure in heart are going to see God. To see God means to be His child and dwell in His presence both now and in His future in His kingdom. 1 John 3, 3. And every man that has this hope, 1 John 3, verse 3, and every man that has this hope in him purifies his heart even as he is pure. And 1 Timothy 3, 1 verse 5, the Bible says, Now the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart. And 1 Peter 1, 22, the Bible says, Seeing that you have purified your souls into obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Matthew 5, verse 9, the Scripture says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The scripture says in Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2 verses 14 through 16, the Bible says, For He is our peace. In other words, Christ is our peace. 
who has made both one, in other words, separated men and God, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the adversarial relationship or the enmity even in the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make it himself of two, one new man, so making peace with man, that he, might have, that he might reconcile both unto God and in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Let me qualify this for just a minute. All through the Old Testament, the presence of God, man was kept from the presence of God by something called a veil. And in Matthew 27, when Jesus Christ was resurrected, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And now every single man that takes the name of his son, Jesus Christ, now has access to God. When you take the son, you now have access to God, the father through the son. The son has broken down the middle wall of partition between God and man, which was represented by the veil in the Old Testament temple. And now every single man that takes the name of Christ now has access to the Father. The peacemakers are those who have been reconciled to God. They have made peace with him through the cross. They now strive to wit by their witness and life to bring others, including their enemies, to be at peace with God. Matthew 5 verses 10 through 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil falsely against you for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward which is in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets which were before you. Persecution will be the fate for all those who seek to live in harmony with God's word for the sake of righteousness. Those who uphold God's standards for truth, justice, and purity, and at the same time refuse to compromise with the present evil society or the lifestyle of lukewarm believers, will undergo unpopularity, rejection, and criticism. Persecution will come from the world and at times from those within the professing church of Jesus Christ. When they experience this suffering, Christians are to rejoice. For those who suffer most, God imparts the highest blessing. John 16, verse 33, the Bible says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, the Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In verse 12, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, not if he's tried, when he's tried, he receive, shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to all them according to his word. 1 Peter 1, 2-8, the Bible says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto grace and to honor and to glory at the appearing of of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love, and whom having not seen yet, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And 1 Peter 4, 12 through 15, the Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. 
If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. On their part, they will be evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. <clears throat> Christians must always be careful to avoid the compromise of God's will in order to avoid shame, ridicule, embarrassment, or lost. The principles of God's kingdom never change. Let me say that again. Christians must always be aware of the temptation to compromise God's will in order to avoid shame, ridicule, embarrassment, or loss. These principles of God's kingdom never change. In 2, Peter, or 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and I say, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you are a Christian, then there are going to be times that you're going to go through something. You're going to endure the wrath of this world which hates God. So stop trying to be like the world, be like God and win the world, and you'll be a lot happier. The world hates you. It's always hated you. It will always hate you. And as a representation of God, it will do everything it can to squeeze the life of God out of you. Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewithal shall that be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast down and trodden under the foot of men. Salt is valuable to give flavor and to preserve from corruption. Hence the church and the believer are to be godly examples of to the world to resist the moral decay and corruption of society. It is our job as Christians to resist the moral decay and the corruption that is in this society. Churches and believers that have become lukewarm quench the power of the Spirit and cease to resist the prevailing spirit of the world will be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Those who become lukewarm will be destroyed by their ways and values of ungodly society. In other words, they will destroy themselves. Every man that destroys himself does it to himself. You have a choice. You have an option. You can follow God faithfully and obediently, or you can spend your time trying to change the church into the world, but you cannot have both. And I can assure you in the second illustration, the consequences are going to be extremely dire and damnable. In Mark 9, verse 49 through 50, the Bible says, For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt hath lost its saltiness, wherewithal shall you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Revelation 3, 14 through 22. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, how that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were hot or cold. So then because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say you're rich and have need of nothing, but inside, you, because you say you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but inside you are wretched, miserable, blind, and poor, and naked. I counsel you to buy of me gold that's tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and put on white raiment, that you may be clothed, and the shame of your nakedness be not revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and dine with him and him with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me on my throne, as I have also overcome and have sat down at my Father's throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches in this world today. It is the last church. I'm going to stop at this point right here. The blessings come to those who follow God in obedience. They are not drawn to God because of what God can do for them. They are not drawn to God because of some personal benefit God could do for them. 
I remember watching a television show called Moms. It was a story about alcoholism and dealing with alcoholism. And they had a little black lady that went into prison and found Jesus in there. And she come out, and she was on fire for God. The other ladies that watched this heard that God provided things, that God would do things for them. And they wound up in church praising God and loving God and all of that that was part of it. And in the next show, they were out of it again. Could have cared less. And I tell you, that represents much of the Christian faith today. As long as God can do for you or you have emotional goosebumps or he can bless you in some way or you've got a great preacher, all of those things are part of it, but that is not the foundation and the core of our belief. And yes, God does want you to have things and God wants you to be happy and rejoice and praise. Don't take my words out of context, but let's face it, we're using it as a hook to get people to church. You don't come to church because of your youth group. You don't come to church because of your worship. You come to church because of Jesus. Is Jesus in your church? Are the tenets of the scriptures being proclaimed and required of its members? Do you have a statement of faith? Are you committed to the truth that you will not bend or bow under the pre a public pressure like in a pandemic when the government says you got to close up? They're hard decisions. But the right decision is we are the light of the world and we need to reflect that light. And we've not done that. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm submitting my ministry to you today that you can know Him today. That you can understand and know the blessing and favor of those that take the name of God of which we proclaim with the very absolute effort we could and pray that the Holy Ghost achieves His mark. Today you can come to know Jesus Christ because you can't have that without this. You cannot come to God without the Son. You cannot come to the Father without the Son. And the Son died at the cross to save your sins. And without an acknowledgement of that, you are still separated from God in your sin. It's convenient to take sin out of the narrative of the church and in the message. Real convenient in this generation and very popular, but it's still just as damnable as it was to everyone that came along before. Your sins must be forgiven. So today, if you know deep down in your sin is keeping you from God, then today I'm going to tell you how. I'm going to say a small prayer. You come to God through repentance. You confess your sins. You acknowledge your sins. And with a contrite heart and a willingness to change your life forever, you bow your knees at the base of an old rugged cross and ask for mercy. And if you do it with a pure heart, the blood of Jesus Christ will save you from your sin. And your acknowledgement through water baptism will confirm your commitment and the Holy Ghost will take up residence inside of your heart and the Word of God will become your central truth. And you will know the Lord Jesus Christ now and eternity by the work of the Spirit, the righteousness of the Word, and the discipline you display in your life. If that is your heart today, we're going to say a prayer. We don't have an altar here. I wish we did. But I can assure you if I was at a church, we would be doing it. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then today I want you to say a prayer with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, today I come to you and I confess my utter need for your salvation. I lay myself at the prostate, at the cross, and I surrender my will to yours. I confess my sins. I confess my adultery. I confess my thieves. I confess my homosexuality. I confess my demonic influence. And today I lay them down at the altar, and I surrender myself to you. And today I'm asking Jesus Christ to come into my heart and be Lord of my life by virtue of being my Savior. Today, in the sight of God and men, I commit my life to you fully and wholly to the grace of God. I thank you for the gift that is salvation. I thank you for giving me new life. I thank you for loving me enough to save me from myself. And today, to the best of my ability, I will follow you to eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.